Hi, I'm Cullen, pastor here at Roots and Branches, and I want to thank you for joining us here today as we celebrate God's love online. Roots and Branches is a church that's all about growing deeper in faith and reaching out in love, and you are invited to join in that with us today. Um, we're going to share in some music in just a moment, and after that, that you're going to hear some announcements that will be an invitation for you to join in what God is doing through Roots and Branches. And so before we get started, please join me in prayer. God of love and life, your truth is too big for us to contain it all in our heads. So in this moment, in this morning, may we open up our hearts instead because your love is accessible to all. Wherever we come from today, in geography, in belief or unbelief, we open ourselves up to your love as it is available to us wherever we happen to be. Meet us where we're at and welcome us into a life of obedience, of love, of acceptance, and truth. Amen. Hello, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you happen to be. We're glad to be spending this time with you. We're going to sing a song called How He Loves. It's kind of the grown-up version of Jesus Loves Me which we can never not hear enough of. And he is jealous for me.
does love you today. God will always love you and meet you right where you're at. And we're going to sing what a beautiful name, what a wonderful name, what a powerful name. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. for Jesus and his beautiful life and his wonderful name. Amen. Hi, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited that you chose out of all of the places where you could check in online and log in from the comfort of your own home. You chose to check in here and we think that's awesome. My name is Anna. I'll be your virtual host this morning. Um, and I just have a few things that I want to mention before I hand things over to Cullen. So um, one of the biggest things that we focus on here at Roots and Branches is 
serving in our community. And COVID has made that very difficult um, to stay safe while doing that because the whole nature of how it works. But as um, we're learning more about it, we're also learning more ways that we can stay safe while still helping others. Um, so a couple of things that we are focusing on doing here in the coming months is helping out some of our neighbors in the area that really could use the hands. Um, they have found great ways to keep us all safe um, and to keep us all separated, but also while still being able to help those that are really in need of things like dinners, for example, clothing, for example, and sometimes just your time. So um, two places that we're doing that right now, Hope for Youth and Anoka, um, they help youth that are homeless um, and help to provide them shelter and to provide them clothing and food and hot meals and things like that. Um, they are in desperate need of volunteers. So we have created an event on our Facebook page that has links to all of the information that you might possibly need in order to help out over there in any way, shape, or form that you feel called to do so. So if you check out the event, Rich and Branches Helps Hope for Youth, um, you can find all of that information that you might need. We're also helping out at Little Blessings of Anoka. We're helping with directing traffic during food shelf distribution. So those are, um, it's a couple hours on a Sunday afternoon, one week in the month. If you want more information on that, you can email me at Anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, dot roots and A-N-D branches at gmail.com. Um, and yeah, we would love to see see anybody who's willing to put their hands and feet to work out there um, and help out in our community in any way that we can. We're also looking to set up a couple of dates in the next coming months to either make our way back to Feed My Starving Children again or also help out at every meal formally shared in story. Um, so look for events of those types to pop up here in the near future as well. Thank you again so much for joining us here. We really appreciate that you are taking the time to get to know a little bit more about who this Jesus guy is and what he was all about in a time in which I think many of us are forgetting um, and finding it hard to really connect and remember his purpose and what he did for us. And um, I, if you haven't listened to last week's sermon, you need to. It was amazing. Um, it gave me goosebumps and it gave me chills and it was a fantastic message for the world that we find ourselves in right now. So I hope that you get out of today's service what I'm going to get out of today's service because I think it's something that we could all use and that we really need right now. So thank you so much again for joining us. We're glad you're here and we will see you soon. I want to thank Anna for welcoming us this morning. I want to thank our band for leading us in music. And before we get started today, there's one more word about Hope for Youth, the organization that helps care for uh, youth experiencing homelessness in our community. And Lori, who's part of our team, our extensions team that works to care for those beyond our walls, is going to share a little bit more about what Hope for Youth does and how you can help today. Hi Roots and Branches, this is Lori from the Extensions team and I'm just coming to you to um, uh, make some requests and talk to some needs that are happening in our community um, and some opportunities for you. So what I'm coming to you with is a call out for Hope for Youth, which is a homeless drop-in center and they also do a lot more with, with homeless youth like getting them set up with education and and jobs and getting them fed and finding them a place to live. Anyways, I am a mentor there on Tuesday nights and I help out these youth that, co that come to the drop-in center in Anoka, right near the church. So what I'm putting a call out to is that there is a need for volunteers. Through COVID, they have lost a few, more than a few volunteers. So if you are up to being a mentor or in any capacity, um, there is an app volunteer application on the website and you just need to fill that out and connect with the volunteer coordinator Nikki at Hope for Youth. If you don't want to go to that extent then you can also provide meals and um, they have them available hot meals for the youth um, Monday through Friday 4 30 to 6 30 and they're that that's there at the drop-in center also. 
Um, and there you can check out that on the website and fill out the volunteer application. They want to track out track all the volunteers that are helping out at that center. The next thing is that there's a donation list, top needs donation list. It's updated weekly, and these are are items that are donated to the youth, um, clothing, um, anything you can think of that um, food. Um, but the top needs for that week is on the um, the website too. Lastly, they love, 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 love tie blankets, fleece tie blankets. I know we've done this before as a group, as a big um, project, but I'm requesting that um, individuals, families, that would be a great family project to create, get some fun fleeces. They love bright colors. They love sports teams. They love um, anything that has a lot of prints. So if you could, some of them just sleep outside and they take two and it's, um, and we get really low. They love them. So that's a project that um, uh, in this post, there will be the link to Hope for Youth and also a link to contact me, um, either my email or uh, my cell phone. So any questions, give me a call. Love to, love to hear from you and see us step up. Miss all of you people at, at Roots and Branches and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. Hi there. Thanks again for joining us today on this, the Sunday before Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And we celebrate that as a community. We celebrate all the those who fight for justice, uh, to work for the cause of the oppressed. And we... Uh, are going to talk about that some today as we move into part three of a series we're calling Letters from Lockdown, Hope and Joy in Philippians. Um, before we go any further, I just got to do a little check-in. How's everybody doing? Uh, in the comments of this video, just let us know how are you doing today and be honest. If you're doing great, we want to hear why. And if you're feeling low, let us know so that we can pray for you and care for you. Because the monotony of pandemic life has gotten to all of us at one point or another over the last few months. I don't know about you, but have you found yourself in a stupor, unable to make simple decisions or to find the motivation to do things that used to be normal? Most days I don't have to leave the house. I can work from home and that means shoveling snow has become mostly optional. I don't have to do it at 6 a.m. so I can pull my car out of the driveway and go to work. I don't have to shovel to clear a path so my kids can go to the school bus. And so I get around to it whenever, <laughs> whenever I get around to it, or when Jenny tells me I have to, whichever comes first. Many of us are in this malaise where we don't have the drive to get out of bed. But do you remember the beginning of the pandemic? So many of us had passion projects we were finally gonna start. I was gonna finally write that book. We were gonna make that sourdough starter. But now all I've got to show after almost a year in quarantine, is that I've used the free trial on four different food services. So, not to brag. Um, but while we are somewhere between inconvenienced and traumatized by the year that we've lived through, Paul, the apostle, was up against even tougher circumstances. As I've shared over the past couple of weeks, Paul was in prison for bearing witness to his faith. His conviction that Jesus had, in fact, come into the world to overthrow all the fear and violence that made Rome tick led the powers that be to view him as dangerous, just like Jesus. So they locked him up. And that's where he sat as he wrote the words of the book of Philippians that we've been reading through the last few weeks. And we're going to continue to read for the next few weeks. Uh, from his prison cell, Paul wrote words of inspiration and hope and energy and encouragement that we also need as we live in our own private lockdowns. And he didn't even have Netflix. So here are the words from Paul as we continue in his letter to the followers of Jesus in the Greek city of Philippi. He wrote this. What I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you. 
God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. Do everything readily and cheerfully, no bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted, a breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night so I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof that I didn't go to all this work for nothing. Even if I am executed here and now, I'll rejoice in being an element in the offering of your faith that you make on Christ's altar a part of your rejoicing. But turn about, turn about's fair play. You must join me in my rejoicing. Whatever you do, don't feel sorry for me. That's from Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. And you can just hear it. Paul, who is, in, who is locked up and can't do God's work in the way he'd like to do, he's calling out to those who are on the outside. Simply keep doing what you've been doing from the beginning. Live in responsive obedience. I love that phrase. It says that obedience is more than simply keep your head down. Responsive obedience points not just to the letter of the law that we need to be good and stay out of trouble, but that we need to be aware of what got, what's going on around us and to do the obedient thing with the moment we've been given. And yes, sometimes that obedience looks like quietly going about your day, tending to your family and your responsibilities, but sometimes when injustice and oppression loom large in our communities on a wide scale, responsive obedience means speaking up, stepping up, putting your money where your mouth is, and putting your words and actions into the service of a loving God. Uh, we have these amazing Google Nest Minis scattered throughout our house, and yes, I know they're spying on me, but I just love them. They're so dang handy. Uh, when, when it's time for supper or time to get ready for bed, I can use them like an intercom throughout the house and, yet, and call out to my four kids, hey Google, broadcast, time to get ready for bed. Now, it may be that my children are being generally obedient in the moments before I broadcast that it's bedtime. And maybe they're doing their homework, maybe they're spending quality time together. Um, and that's all well and good, but when I broadcast to them, time to get ready for bed, I expect responsive obedience. That they would pay attention to the new thing that I'm asking of them and to do that instead. Responsive obedience sees the very real need among young people experiencing homelessness and hope for youth and says, what can I do? Responsive obedience notices that a friend's Facebook posts have been getting a little dark and gives them a call. And responsive obedience can turn its attention to the needs of whole communities and nations as well. Over the last year, I believe that God has been broadcasting new instructions to the church in America. I mean... They're new in the fact we're hearing them now. Because God has been broadcasting this message for a long time, but just like my children, sometimes it takes a few tries before the message gets through. For those who are paying attention to our world, for those who are listening to the voices of the oppressed, for those who have compassion enough to be moved to do something, God is broadcasting something to the church in America. And God has turned the volume all the way up. So if you can't hear it, it's because you aren't listening to God. And if you know anything about me or our church or where I come from, you can tell already I'm talking about the racial reckoning that began with the death of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and sparked protests across our country and across the world. The uprisings that resulted created a national conversation around race unlike anything I've experienced in my lifetime. People are reading books about the impact of institutional racism and they're having conversations about critical race theory with their family and neighbors. At Roots and Branches, we have been having this conversation for a while. And so uh, it was really eye-opening to see how churches chose to respond to our nation's growing awareness that the state of affairs around matters of race was not only unjust, but unsustainable. Most white churches have realized that they aren't exempt from the conversation around race just because there aren't any people of color showing up on their Sunday mornings. And we've realized that all of us have, to some degree or another, been participants and beneficiaries of racist systems that keep racism in circulation. Some of you might not believe me about all this stuff, and that's okay. But just for fun, I'd like all of my mostly white audience to imagine with me for a moment. Imagine it's 1963. 
Imagine stepping into a church on a Sunday morning in Birmingham, Alabama. A church not unlike Roots and Branches, mostly full of white faces, but in the Deep South, in an era when discrimination based on race was the law of the land. And if I stood in front of the congregation and said, raise your hand if you're racist, anyone? Who are the racists out here? What do you think the response would be? Do you think one hand would go up? I don't think so. This is the time and place where we look back and say, that was racism, run amok in America. But none of the people who are part of creating and sustaining a system of injustice against a whole group of people based on their skin color would have called themselves racist. From our place in history, racism seems like a simple category. We know what racism looks like. We learned about it in history class. We saw it on the news. We know that we aren't as bad as those people. However, the unfortunate truth is that racism is a complicated phenomenon and it lives on and it adapts to changing cultures and it is alive and well in our communities today and a generation from now, people will be able to look back on today with the same clarity and point at the racism happening in our communities right now. And we can call for unity, for decorum, for peace, and we can be well-meaning in the process when all we really want is to stop being inconvenienced by a struggle that we don't feel impacts us personally. Most of us are simply well-meaning racists, just like the people in the pews of every white church in the Jim Crow South. We just wear it differently. And it was those kinds of well-meaning racists, white Christians, pastors no less, who saw Martin Luther King Jr. and his movement as a bunch of troublemakers. Uh, King had been a major player in a demonstration in Birmingham, a place where they had a law against large demonstrations, however peaceful they might be. And so on April 12th, 1963, Dr. King and others were arrested for violating Alabama's law against mass public demonstrations. I believe that Dr. King followed the leading of God's Holy Spirit when he did that. That his act of protest was a sign that he was participating in responsive obedience to God, which just happened to look like nonviolent disobedience in his world. And so he got arrested. And while he sat in jail, he read an open letter written to him by eight white clergy members from Birmingham. Um, I know that's not what I would do if I had to spend the night in jail. But I'm not Dr. King either. It was published for all to see in the Birmingham News, calling King's strategy unwise and untimely, and appealing to all the citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. Of course, law and order don't make any sense when you're the victim of oppression. Separate but equal doesn't work when some are more equal than others. And that was part of Dr. King's response to their letter. The words Dr. King wrote in prison during that time came to be known as letter from a Birmingham jail. He scribbled on napkins and had paper handed down to him from adjacent cells until he was allowed a notepad of his own so that he could write a letter that would go out to these churches. And so, as we began our time here with a letter, to an, a letter from an Ephesian jail, it seems only appropriate that I share these words with you words that feel as much like scripture as anything else written after the ink dried on our Bible. In his reply to these eight white pastors, Dr. King wrote, There was a time when the church was very powerful. In the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Whenever the early Christians entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and immediately sought to convict the Christians for being disturbers of the peace and outside agitators. But the Christians pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven, called to obey God rather than man. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God-intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. By their effort and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils as infanticide and gladiatorial contests. Things are different now. 
So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often even vocal sanction of things as they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. So in case you're at all confused by the rhetoric being thrown around about who has the right to rise up and protest and who should just start listening, the insurrection that happened at the Capitol building was an uprising in defense of the status quo. The call of the follower of Jesus to, is to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and Paul and Martin Luther King Jr. and each and every one of them made good trouble for the sake of those for whom the status quo was another form of shackles or sometimes even a death sentence. We must live lives that reflect the love of God but that does not mean passivity or complacency. Reflecting the love of God means showing up in times and places where people can't hear that the love of God is broadcasting through creation and inviting them to listen. For the oppressed, it's doing our part to help. For the oppressor, it means inviting them to see the sin in their hearts and in their lives so that they too can live in ways that reflect God's love. The way of Jesus, the way of Paul, the way of Martin Luther King Jr. And, and what do these three men also have in common? Their fight to make the love of God a reality led to their deaths. Just less than a year after writing those words, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. So what do we do with that? Here's what Paul said in the words that we began with today. Even if I'm executed here and now, I'll rejoice in being an element in the offering of your faith that you make on Christ's altar. A part of your rejoicing, but turnabout's fair play, so you must join me in my rejoicing. And what did Dr. King say in his letter? That we must reclaim that sacrificial spirit of the early church. And we can do it in the name of justice for all. So may you be drawn by God's spirit into a life of responsive obedience, where you can see what must be done and have the spark to make it happen. May you broadcast God's unconditional love in a world full of conditions. May you never settle for comfort or justice. May you stand against the status quo and become so God intoxicated that no matter what it might cost you, you can act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Amen. Please stick around for one last song.
Let the weary ride.